Ruslan says you have a moral obligation to make a lot of money as a Christian. I would argue that it is the Christian's moral obligation to do so. That it, it, it is your moral obligation to do so. If you can build a seven-figure net worth without it mastering you, hear me loud and clear. If you can build a seven-figure net worth without it mastering you, without it ruining your life by investing $100 a month, okay, you should absolutely do that. Is Ruslan right? that the Bible teaches you to pursue personal wealth so you can eventually start blessing others? You know what requires the ability to do all of those things? Resource. It requires somebody's money somewhere to have the ability to have extra food, extra clothes, extra time to take care of the least of these. And when you take care of the least of these, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, you're doing it onto the Lord. So we're compartmentalizing and we're saying, no, 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 no. That's not about money, even though the next verse is about people who have abundance of resource and money. <gasps> or does the Bible at best belittle those who trust in money as having little faith and at worst strongly condemns those who pursue money? Pointing out this gets very triggering. And even right now, there's going to be people that are going to pull out verses out of context. And, and, and let's say, well, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter the, the, the kingdom than I, I have a needle. You're, you're pulling that verse completely out of context. You're missing everything else the Bible says about wealth and stewardship. You're pulling one verse out and you're ignoring an entire chapter. Go read Matthew chapter 25 and then read it again. And then read it again and then read it again. Anytime, any place, I'd be happy to discuss with Ruslan his bankrupt best arguments that the Bible teaches you to get rich or die trying. When he says, go read this proverb or that Matthew 25 chapter, we could. Go read Matthew chapter 25 and then read it again. And then read it again and then read it again. And see if whether or not it amounts to what he alludes to. At best, Ruslan is confused and doesn't realize he's incoherent when talking about God wanting you to get money. At worst, Ruslan has a money idol and he's spreading the good news that God wants you to get rich, to bless others, and sees himself as fulfilling the niche of a Christian who talks about money in a positive light. Um, about how to get rich without getting lucky. A lot of this is pulled from Naval. A lot of this is pulled from Gary V. A lot of this is pulled from Dave Ramsey. And this is me putting my own spin on it. All the while scapegoating, the only people who oppose him are lazy people who rather watch TV and seek personal pleasure than work hard. My challenge to you guys is, outside of what you what you make, like like let's just like forget about that. Are you being faithful with what you've been given? Have you been faithful with what you've been given? The time, the talent, and the treasure you have. Have you been faithful with it? Are you squandering it? Because I don't want to hear you argue about being broke and you're watching thirty hours of TV a week. Is Ruslan straw man right in that your only choices are? make money or binge Netflix. Sure, Ruslan's false teaching about money is not as blatant or bad as the typical prosperity gospel, but the serpent is described as subtle, not blatant. Ruslan says you have a moral obligation to store up treasure here on earth to give out to other people one day. At best, Ruslan is saying if you get a lot, you can give a lot. If you make a lot of money now, you would have more time and opportunity to help others. That sounds plausible. It's not in the Bible. It goes back to at least Andrew Carnegie and his gospel of wealth, who said, I spent the first 50 years of my life making money and the second half of my life giving it away to do the most good and the least harm. I admit to my human ear, that sounds fine. Get money so you can serve others with it later. That seems harmless and fine, but is it in line with the Bible? Let's compare. Jesus told the rich young ruler to right away give away his wealth. Just you're 18, you take $100 and you just park it, S&P 500. Robinhood, S&P 500, there's a link to sign up for Robinhood if you're not signed up, S&P 500. Just take that $100. Jesus didn't tell the young rich man to keep investing his money and then later on give it to the poor after its compound interest multiplied. Jesus told Peter and Andrew to stop fishing while they were making money and he'd make them fishers of men. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. 
Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The apostles got worried, spending half a year's wages to feed the thousands food. But Jesus rebuked them, saying, Ye have little faith, and multiplied the loaves and fishes to feed the large crowds. Jesus said the poor woman who gave two pennies gave more than all the wealthy people that day, who, like Ruslan teaches, must have gotten busy earning more money to give more. But Jesus didn't endorse that path. In fact, he says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? How Ruslan could read that verse and not see the plain, you can't serve God and money, is a clear case of willful hardness of his heart. Reject money being your God. You, you can't serve both God and money. To Ruslan's ears, he hears that, yes, you can't serve God and money, but Jesus only said, don't seek lots of money to use for yourself. That's all bad. But the deeper meaning Ruslan sees beyond the text is, go get lots of money and teach others to get lots of money so you can use it for others. Then you're not serving money, money is serving you. My buddy Jason Mayfield says, when it comes to the whole, you can't serve God and money, and he, he has this great bar. He says, money is a terrible master, but a great servant, right? But money is a means to an end just like anything else, man. Just like anything else. Money is, is a means to an end. Money is the vehicle that a lot of times you need to go and do ministry. The, 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 the vehicle you need to go and build wells in Africa. The vehicle you need. You, you, you think money just grows on trees? It's a tool. Amen. But if we snap out of Ruslan's delusion, those special clauses are not from Jesus. Jesus only said, you can't serve God in money. Moses didn't need money to get the Jews out of Egypt. Jesus didn't use lots of money to spread his message about the gift of eternal life. Neither did Paul. Money is, is a means to an end. Money is the vehicle that a lot of times you need to go and do ministry. Why does Ruslan tell you that you need lots of money to help people get eternal life? Ruslan is clearly teaching you to seek out wealth and ignoring Jesus' clear warning. Also, Ruslan is inconsistent with he's only telling you to use wealth to bless others from his own words once he got out of debt, he went on pleasure-seeking vacations with his wife. We, after we became debt-free, we ended up saving six months of expenses. We went and traveled, and we saw the world and took vacations. Um, years ago, we went to Paris, we went to Rome, we went to New York, we went to Atlanta. We did a lot of traveling. Ruslan's greed is only partially covered behind the lie that one day, all the gathering of treasure he teaches you to get will be, all be used for charity. The flexibility that money could bring, the generosity that money could bring, okay, the, the ability to give money away, to build things, to help people. Which is most likely not the full truth. Build things, to help people, to enjoy things, to travel, to spend more time with your family, okay? So money isn't the goal, it's what money can do for you. If we're honest, in America, there's no reason why anyone who's of able body and sound mind, should not retire as a millionaire. Now that's like Russo you're talking about. That's the prosperity gospel. People who store up millions will most likely use a lot of it on pleasure, seeking treats for themselves, similar to what Ruslan did on his vacation. We went and traveled and we saw the world and took vacations. Um, then doing what Jesus taught to give all to the needy right away. Ruslan's wealth is just a way greedy people can justify their stocking up of treasure this side of eternity by a loose commitment to giving some of it away one day. Jesus didn't say the kingdom of heaven is filled with guys like Andrew Carnegie who got wealthy and then became great philanthropists. The Bible teaches money is more like a trap, a snare. It will draw you in like the one ring. Follow me here. Give the ring to Frodo. And get you to worship it and its power than the power of God. Why not use this ring? Money is, is a means to an end. Money is the vehicle that a lot of times you need to go and do ministry. Give Gondor the weapon of the enemy. Let us use it against him. You cannot wield it. None of us can. 
Money is a terrible master, but a great servant. The One Ring answers to Sauron alone. It has no other master. And what would a ranger know of this man? And instead of focusing on how to draw closer to God and opportunities to serve others, you will be drawn in how to make more money and ignore or overlook the needs of others who don't always need your money but need your time. To disciple someone else doesn't take money, it takes time. To visit the sick or in prison doesn't take money but time. If your time is consumed with making money, you won't have the time to serve others. Jesus washed his disciples' feet and told others to follow his serving example. Jesus wasn't charging them for foot baths. It doesn't take a lot of money to be like John the Baptist and go out in the wilderness eating bugs and telling people to repent. It doesn't take money to study the Bible. It takes time. It doesn't take money to spend time with God alone like Jesus did. It takes time. Yes, Ruslan is right. You shouldn't be wasting your time watching TV, but neither should you be wasting it storing up treasure here. Even if you deceive yourself into justifying it's okay because you tell yourself, I will give some of it away one day or use it to take care of your family later on. If you follow Ruslan's carnal logic, then Jesus was a disgrace, not an example to follow. Jesus, who died homeless, Jesus did not leave a great financial inheritance to his widowed mom. He only asked John to look after her. What a loser and denier of the faith, according to Ruslan's carnal logic. Is it more likely your flesh or spirit that wants to hear there is some excuse to get rich? Which your flesh or spirit wants to hear Ruslan tickle your ears and tell you to ignore all the warning, the direct verses about wealth, if you at least pursue wealth with the intention of one day using it for good, that'd be something holy. Ruslan says it's your moral obligation to get rich. That it is the Christian's moral obligation to do so. That it, it, it is your moral obligation obligation to do so. If you can build a seven-figure net worth. The Bible says this, Timothy 6, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, Flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Clearly, Paul wrote, flee from all desire to get wealthy. Be content with just food and clothing. Why is Ruslan telling you it's your moral obligation to get wealthy? That it, it, it is your moral obligation to do so. If you can build a seven-figure net worth. Why is Ruslan opposing the Apostle Paul? Of passage for you, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root to all kinds of evil. Some people eager to make money have wandered from faith from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And uh, I want to find this other passage. For Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap into many foolish and harmful desires and plunge into ruin and destruction. And it says, for the love of money is a root to all kinds of people. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now check how this is juxtaposed with Proverbs 13, 11, where it says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers Little by little, whoever gathers money, little by little makes it grow, right? So if you're trying to get rich quick, if you're trying to make a lot of money really fast, if you're trying to land in that job position and you're forcing it or you're, 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 you're trying to produce fruit out of season, usually that's not going to lead you into the place you want to be in the first place, right? Meaning that you, you, you taking the shortcut. We just saw Ruslan read out loud that verse that warns about people who desire wealth are in error, and then seeing Ruslan get delusional and quickly go, it's only warning about those who try to get rich quick. And then sleight of hand goes for another verse. Paul wrote, no distinction in the wanting to get rich is only bad if it's done quickly. Paul wrote, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Paul didn't say it's just bad 
to want to get rich quick, Paul said it's bad if anyone wants to get rich, regardless of how long it takes. That it, it, it is your moral obligation to do so. If you can build a seven-figure net worth, if we're honest, in America, there's no reason why anyone who's of able body and sound mind should not retire as a millionaire. Now that's like Russo, you're talking about, that's the prosperity gospel. Jesus says you can't serve God and money, and because Ruslan won't be obedient and submit to that, his mind gets delusional and he sees it's only bad to want to get rich quick. Ruslan says, if you try to get rich, you will have a lot to give later on. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 6, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain there's never been a time like this right now where you can get an app called Robinhood, download it to your phone, and start buying little, little shares of an index fund like S&P 500 or QQQ, and your money will grow there for you. And you start understanding what the law of 72 is. What's the law of 72? The law of 72 says if you put something in a... In a, in a but put their hope in God, which provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And this was a lot of this was also a family, by the way, too. There's just, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. We're, we're going we're going through this debt free journey. Don't ask us for money. We don't have any money to give you right now. Don't ask to borrow money. We don't have money to give you. Do not ask. Right. Um, In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So they may take hold of life that is truly life. The scripture not only warns against trusting in money and money schemes, but the rich should ignore their money and just go do good deeds. Paul wrote to Timothy, command the rich not to put their hope in wealth and go do good deeds. So why is Ruslan telling you to put your hope in wealth? If you're busy chasing money, you can't be busy serving others. Serving others does not mean charging them for your services, as Ruslan might twist. Jesus no doubt means to serve others is at no charge to them. Unless Ruslan wants to argue that the best example of fulfilling Matthew 25, taking care of the least of these, is McDonald's for selling cheap food to hungry people, Coca-Cola for quenching people's thirst, the Hilton Hotels for taking in the stranger, and prison guards for visiting those in prison. If you're so wrapped up making six and seven figures like Ruslan commands, how would you have any spare time to serve others? People working that much to make that much will most likely not have time to do anything else. I know Ruslan says you sacrifice a lot of time now, but making money so you can eventually have more free time, but you don't ever need lots of money to volunteer to serve others. Oh, and you know what you need to do to care for people? The widow, the orphan, per the person in prison, the naked person, the homeless person, you know what you need? You need resources, you need money. The Bible never tells you go chase money to one day have more free time. It just tells you to make enough to provide for your basics and seek God and serve others. I don't think where I live is some outlier. Here, there are churches I know that get donated food to give out so they don't lack resources, but they need volunteers to give out the food. There are thrift stores and churches that have lots of donated clothes, but they need hands to sort them. It doesn't take a lot of money to go visit a nursing home or volunteer at a foster kids night event Big brother, big sister, youth group, 6th grade to 12th grade that need volunteers to help disciple. Kids ministries on Sunday mornings working with 6 months to 5th graders that need volunteers. All those are good deeds would be in line with what Paul told Timothy to tell rich people go to do. I could go on and on, but Jesus said it best. The harvest is plenty, the workers are few. Jesus didn't say he needed more money, but he needed more laborers. I doubt where I live is so unique that it's the only place where money is not the limiting factor, but the lack of workers is the bigger limiting factor. Ruslan is misleading would-be harvesters to not go harvest for God, but harvest for their own bank accounts. Surely Ruslan will say he's also co-signs those good deeds, but he's saying you should do that, but also be making as much money as possible the other part of the week to afford to do those things. He doesn't see that he quickly muddies the clear waters and gets your focus back on money, and Paul wrote to Timothy, command the rich not to put their hope in wealth. Okay, so right now, the market grows by approximately 10 to 12%. Okay, so the rule of 72, if we divide 12%, if we divide 12%, just follow along for a second. I wish I had this written down, but if, you, if we divide 12% into 72, 
Okay? That means that every six years, your money will double. By the way, I put my money in a QQQ, the QQQ, I'm not a financial advisor. I put my money in a QQQ, and my money in the QQQ right now on Robinhood has, generates me, let's, I'll give you guys the percentage, 56%. It's a bull market right now. Ruslan might follow part of what Paul says about good deeds, but he disobeys Paul by telling you to put your faith in wealth, which is uncertain. Because I'm telling you, if you know that if you put your money and you invest it and you don't just consume everything, that you actually save, that you get out of debt, that you start investing, if you know that that's going to generate a return for you and you don't do that, because of whatever weird, toxic, limited thinking you have, whatever terrible poverty gospel you've heard, fam, that is not okay. Ruslan says, aim to get a lot, to give a lot. The Bible says in Mark 12, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Who are you going to listen to, Ruslan or Jesus? Oh, and you know what you need to do to care for people? The widow, the orphan, per the person in prison, the naked person, the homeless person. You know what you need? You need resources. You need money. Yeah, it's interesting that Matthew... Ruslan says you need to start investing so you can retire a multimillionaire. But the Bible says don't store up for yourself treasure on earth where moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Oh, and you know what you need to do to care for people? The widow, the orphan, per the person in prison, the naked person, the homeless person. You know what you need? You need resources. You need money. Yeah, it's interesting that Matthew... Ruslan says you need lots of money to help lots of people. But the Bible says in Acts 3, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Christ Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. They recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them to the place called Solomon's colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us if, if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Ruslan says, if you don't have millions of dollars, you're not providing for your family and are worse than an unbeliever. This, this verse right here haunts me. I'm going to read you guys two verses that haunt me, and I mean haunt me. The first one is is 1 Timothy 5.8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And this was a lot of this was also a family, by the way, too. There's just, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. We're, we're, going, we're going through this debt-free journey. Don't ask us for money. We don't have any money to give you right now. Don't ask to borrow money. We don't have money to give you. Do not ask, right? Um, 1 Timothy 5.8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And this was a lot of this was also a family, by the way, too. There's just, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. We're, we're going, we're going through this debt-free journey. Don't ask us for money. We don't have. 
What I just did with editing together Ruslan is an example of taking the meaning out of context. Paul's meaning about providing is a Christian should be the first trying to take care of their own. If we are to give to whomever ask, even our enemies, then it's a no-brainer we should be the first trying to help out those close to us. The meaning Paul wrote to Timothy about the person who doesn't provide for their family, just because Ruslan said in the video, hey, there was a time period where uh, we told our relatives, hey, don't ask us for money, we don't have any money. Does that mean he's worse than an unbeliever? No, obviously not. But it edited it together to show how quickly me, you, anyone, we, that we can twist the meaning of what was said and go, hey, look, you're not following what um, the Bible says. Most likely now that Ruslan is making six or seven figures, he would be helpful with his family and others in need. Just because one time in your life you have no money and a distant relative asks you and you can't lend doesn't mean you're disobeying the providing for one's family. By admitting that and using it as an example, not taking the point seriously that Ruslan really messed up for one period of his life for not lending money to some relatives, that's even if they ask. He might have just been saying, hey, it was just, uh, you know, we just said don't ask us for money. And I don't know if they actually did or they didn't. But either way, I don't think that means, oh, he's forever worse than an unbeliever. Just like, oh, if you're not careful, you can quickly uh, run in the wrong direction really fast with, well, these words kind of sound like this. But that's not the meaning that Paul meant. So when Paul wrote that at that time, you know, it's a different culture. Maybe women weren't working as much. And so if a widow didn't have uh, her husband alive to provide for her and there was no social security, and if the woman couldn't quickly um, hop in the uh, job market and had no way to provide for herself, it was more of a common thing for, well, who's going to now provide for this woman? But I still think you can take the spirit of that to be like, yeah, of course, if a Christian is, if Jesus says even provide for your enemies, then of course you should provide for your family members. You know, maybe one time a whole bunch of things happen, you have no money and a distant relative asks and you can't lend them. Does that mean you're disobeying the providing for one's family? Or even if it was, even if you did mess up, you know, we repent, change and try to do better. And anyway, so I was doing that and I'm admitting hey, this is me twisting the meaning and as an example, how quickly it can be done. But Ruslan for real takes the meaning out of context. That verse doesn't mean you have to spoil your family with fancy vacations and luxury. Provide does not mean pamper. Ruslan takes provide to mean pamper. I don't know why this verse haunts him when he should be haunted by all the verses about not seeking to be wealthy, but he deliberately disobeys them. That's what should haunt him. Providing for one's family seems to be non-controversial or spooky. No one is on team deadbeat dads. No one is saying being a deadbeat dad is the way to go, and it's haunting because maybe the deadbeat dad community have a slick sales pitch, and you could easily be under their spell. Here would be a good time to say something in support of Ruslan. We all make mistakes. I made plenty. As I don't think everything Ruslan does is fruitless. I think he is growing his talents by being vocal about the gospel and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think God could care less about if Ruslan grows his net worth and is upset that Ruslan focuses on it so much and teaches others to do so too. I think God is happy with the things Ruslan gets right and when Ruslan is trying to grow the body of Christ and reach lost people with the good news of the resurrection. And that God wishes Ruslan would stick to that and bringing more souls to Christ is the increase of talents that God wants us to grow, not money. Matthew 16, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. Jesus is coming back to reward us with what we have done in growing the number of people in God's kingdom, not our bank accounts. Sure, if you use your bank account to spread the kingdom, that's okay. 
but it's not the only marker or most important. And there are so many scriptures, red flags about money, that it's reckless. Ruslan focuses so much on it. Is it with God all things are possible? Or with Ruslan, it's with money all things are possible. God doesn't need your money. God wants your obedience and warns about seeking money. So you should be obedient to that warning. Back to provide for your family. Money is a tool to help people. Money is a tool to build a life where your kids can thrive, where your, where your spouse can thrive, where you can be a blessing to people. And um, that verse haunts me. And I'll read you guys another one. And this is a, you know, in terms of how to make more money, we're going to kind of segue this way right now. And I'm going to tell you guys about some stuff I'm going to be doing to actually help you guys more money. No, no, no. Get Ruslan's right. You should provide for your family. I don't think anyone is in support of, hey, go be a deadbeat dad. Uh, I mean, who would even make such, who would even, like when you go like, oh, I'm taking a strong stance that you need to provide for your family. Well, Jesus says, well, of course you're nice to those who are nice to you. And of course you love your kids. Don't even the heathens and pagans do that. Like it's not controversial to go, you shouldn't be a deadbeat dad. Nonetheless, Ruslan is right. You should provide for your family. But I don't think you need six or seven figures to do that. Proverbs 30, eight through nine. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? If you give your family a life of luxury and they forget God, then you didn't provide them with what is most important. If there are two brothers, older brother goes out, gets a six-figure income, works long hours, but provides his family with a fancy life, fancy vacations. But the younger brother has a job, pays the bills, but works shorter hours and he has more time to spend with his family, taking them to go volunteer at food giveaways, volunteer at the thrift store, they go to foster care, kids nights, they go visit their family in the nursing home, he studies the Bible with his family, they don't have the fanciest house or the fanciest vacations, which brother is providing better for his family's souls? I don't know if God wants you to be average. I think God wants you to be a good steward and be the very best that you can be with the time, talent, and treasure he's given you. So in this entire conversation about money, what we do is we remove context. Ruslan says your finances aren't your own, but does the Bible teach God is focused on how much money is in your bank, investment portfolio, or retirement fund? And so the question comes down to is what is God's heart for our finances? And I would direct you to the scriptures, go read Proverbs, Read it again. Read a chapter a day. Second of all, I would say read Matthew chapter 25. And what you'll find is that it's not about the amount. It's about the heart. It's not about are you a billionaire? Are you a millionaire? It's about have you been faithful with what you've been given? And see, and this is where we start poking. Because if we're honest, if we're honest in America, there's no reason why anyone who's of able body and sound mind should not retire as a millionaire. Now that's like Russo, you're talking about, that's the prosperity gospel, how dare you? No, no, no. You have to be kidding. Jesus said, isn't life more than clothes and food? Jesus is trying to get us to a transcendent perspective about our eternal souls. Why is Ruslan trying to pull us back into our bank accounts, back to the food and clothes stuff Jesus was trying to get us to see beyond? If we're honest, in America, there's no reason why anyone who's of able body and sound mind should not retire as a millionaire. Jesus will care about, did you try to make more converts? Did you try to disciple people? And to his credit, Ruslan, you do this. You do do those right things. But you don't have to worry. Remember Jesus said, don't worry about what am I going to eat? Where am I, what am I going to wear? Ruslan, you don't have to worry about your money hobby horse. You have. You're actually doing some of the things Jesus cares about. And you could be even more fruitful if you just prune out this money idol, bad branch you have. Matthew 13, 22. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. 
This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Ruslan, you are right now the seed among the thorns, being choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth. But if you rip out your money idol, you could be the good soil, the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred times what was sown. That is what the parable of the talents is also about, about increasing the people and depth of closeness to being obedient to God. You mean to tell me that you think that Jesus is okay based on everything we've read and you not getting out of debt, you not having a plan for your money, and you just kind of willy-nilly floating through life like a butterfly, buying whatever you want, doing whatever you want, consuming whatever you want. You mean to tell me that that's the heart of God for you? Ruslan implies God is looking down from heaven and most concerned with how much money do we have in our investment funds. Ruslan acts like God is most concerned with us not being in debt and how well we are doing financially when it's hard to believe Jesus cares at all about that, considering he told the young rich ruler to give all that he had away immediately. Either Ruslan is right that you should be preoccupied with growing your investment or retirement fund, or Jesus is right that you shouldn't be worried about that. In fact, it'd be okay if you gave away everything that you had immediately. Uh, this is not a video, it's a podcast by someone named Naval um, about how to get rich without getting lucky. A lot of this is pulled from Naval, a lot of this is pulled from Gary V. a lot of this is pulled from Dave Ramsey, and this is me putting my own spin on it. Ruslan says, hey, I got this from Dave Ramsey, from this other guy. Right, he didn't get it from the Bible. Ruslan got these ideas from outside the Bible and then looked for verses in the Bible that might support them and willfully ignored or twisted verses that contradict them. Solution, all of us make mistakes. I make mistakes, you make mistakes, Ruslan has made these mistakes. The solution is the same for all our mistakes. Repent, learn, and turn from our sins. Ruslan says he knows lots of great rich people and they're probably better than you because they got rich by being better people. We have such a backwards, toxic view of money. Um, we misquote scripture. We, we think that the, the wealthy people, wealthy people are evil and all wealthy people are greedy. And that's just, that's just not true. That's just not true. Um, a lot of wealthy people are very hardworking, very generous, very gracious. And so you ask yourself, like, well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Are they generous or they gracious because they're wealthy and they don't have to worry about anything? Or did they become wealthy by being generous and gracious and working hard? right? That is the question. And so I want to talk about money and why money is important. And if you But the Bible says in James, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one sitting wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? We, we think that the, the wealthy people, wealthy people are evil and all wealthy people are greedy. And that's just, that's just not true. That's just not true. Um, a lot of wealthy people are very hardworking very generous very later in james 5 come now you rich weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten your gold and your silver have rusted and the rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire it is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which have been withheld by you cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. We, we think that the, the wealthy people, wealthy people are evil and all wealthy people are greedy. And that's just, that's just not true. That's just not true. Um, a lot of wealthy people are very hardworking, very generous. Very
Well, I'm telling you guys this is because, hear me loud and clear, is because I want us as Christians to flourish and thrive on this side of eternity. Ruslan says he hates debt and wants you to not be average and get rich and this and that state of eternity. But the Bible says in Luke 6, looking at the disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now for you will laugh. But woe to you who are rich for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who feel well fed now for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Money is a tool to help people. Money is a tool to build a life where your kids can thrive, where your, where your spouse can thrive, where you can be a blessing to people. Ruslan says you need money to provide resources to bless others with later. But Jesus belittled people in his day who thought like that with statements like, Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. You, you, you think money just grows on trees? If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You of little faith. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And money is the vehicle that a lot of times you need to go and do ministry. And your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus didn't tell his people to store up wealth in the physical like Ruslan. Money is a tool to help people. Money is a tool to build a life where your kids can thrive, where your, where your spouse can thrive, where you can be a blessing to people. But store up treasure in heaven. How does Ruslan not see this? Other than he's hardened his heart. Ruslan says, honor God with your time, talent, and treasure, but Ruslan is telling you to devote your time and talent into getting personal treasure. Ruslan says, money is treasure. The Bible says, this is treasure. Colossians 2, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches and complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Because I'm telling you, if you know that if you put your money and you invest it, and you don't just consume everything, that you actually save, that you get out of debt, that you start investing, if you know that that's going to generate a return for you, and you don't do that, because of whatever weird, toxic, limited thinking you have, whatever terrible poverty gospel you've heard, fam, that is not okay. Ruslan says you ought to invest, but the Bible says this about investing. This is Jesus talking. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, well, what should I do? I have no place to store up my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Ruslan will no doubt add to the text and go, it's only warning against having money but not works towards God. It doesn't mean you can't have money and be close to God. And Ruslan is right. As possible, rich people will go into the kingdom of heaven. Pointing out this gets very triggering. And even right now, there's going to be people that are going to pull out verses out of context and, 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 and say, well, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter the, the, the kingdom than I, I have a needle. You're, you're pulling that verse completely out of context. You're missing everything else the Bible says about wealth and stewardship. You're pulling one verse out and you're ignoring an entire chapter. But Ruslan willfully ignores Jesus singled out. It's especially hard for rich people to enter heaven. Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. 
But when the young man heard the statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people this is impossible, with God all things are possible. Pointing out this gets very triggering. And even right now, there's going to be people that are going to pull out verses out of context. And, and, and let's say, well, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter the, the, the kingdom than I, I have a needle. You're, you're pulling that verse completely out of context. You're missing everything else the Bible says about wealth and stewardship. You're pulling one verse out and you're ignoring an entire chapter. How can Ruslan be looking out for your soul and leading you down a path Jesus said makes it harder for you to get into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus did say the road is narrow and few find it. I guess that means regardless of how wealthy you are, there won't be a lot on the narrow road, but Jesus does make special warning that it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say an equivalent warning about the middle class or the poor. Ruslan changes the goalpost and goes, well, if you zoom out of that verse, the broader message is Jesus was getting at was it's impossible for people to be saved without God. Ruslan is willfully ignoring the plain fact that Jesus said it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Ruslan will kick and scream that that verse only meant to say that only people who get saved are saved by God. The rest is just fluff, irrelevant. Ruslan tries to bury that Jesus still said it's hard for rich people to make into the kingdom of heaven. Was Jesus lying when he said those direct words, it's hard for a rich person to enter heaven? And then immediately repeated and elaborated on that point. If Ruslan would keep reading that passage, then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the first last. Did Jesus tell Peter, stop following me so closely and go get a high value skill and make more money and you will be rewarded? No, the opposite. Re-look at the young rich ruler story again, this time from Luke 18. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all. We had to follow you. Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. In Luke 18, Jesus had nothing good to say about the rich ruler. And unlike Ruslan, Jesus doesn't tell Peter, Go get rich like that young ruler. No, Jesus tells Peter and the other disciples who left their wealth to come work for him that anyone who gives up wealth to pursue the kingdom of God will be rewarded. Ruslan has it backwards where he teaches if you pursue worldly wealth and invest your money good, you will get rewards in heaven. Ruslan says more money, more problems, you can smooth over for the God. Money is a tool to help people money is a tool to build a life where your kids can thrive where your where your spouse can thrive where you can be a blessing to people and um money is is a means to an end money is the vehicle that a lot of times you need to go and do ministry ruslan says more money more problems you can smooth over for god but the bible says this now for some time a man named simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of samaria he boasted he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. 
But when they believed Philip, as he had proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized and followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed and the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I may lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Money is, is a means to an end. Money is the vehicle that a lot of times you need to go and do ministry. What you're really after is the flexibility that money could bring, the generosity that money could bring, okay? The, the ability to give money away, to build things, to help people, to enjoy things, to travel. Ruslan says the Bible wants you to be rich because this proverb, a good person leaves an inheritance to their grandkids. To Jesus or an apostle, we know, leave a large monetary inheritance to their grandkids and was commended for it. Jesus talked about storing up treasure in heaven. How could that not be applicable to this proverb that instead of Ruslan insisting it's talking about a fat check to your grandkids, an alternative view could be you discipled your grandkids to seek treasure in heaven or by raising your kids well, they should be in a position to teach your grandkids well and teach them how to also store up treasure in heaven. Not only is that an alternative, it seems far superior because that inheritance would not decay or ever disappear. A better inheritance to leave your grandkids would be to teach them apologetics, why we have good reasons, evidence to think the Bible is more likely true than not. Leaving your grandkids a good testimony is more valuable than leaving them a bunch of money. Here's verses, and, and then sometimes Ruslan will go like, well, you need a lot of money so your wife can stay at home and watch over your kids. I know guys who make 50 grand and their wives stay at home. I even know a few who make less than 50 grand and their wives stay at home. You don't need to make as much of the six and seven figures Ruslan's talking about in order to have your wife stay at home. If you keep your expenses low, you don't need to make six or seven figures to have Here's verses in Proverbs that prove the wealth the Bible encourages you to seek is not physical money, but wisdom. Proverbs 3.13 How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, for her profit is better than the profit of silver, and her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Proverbs 8.10 Take my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all the desirable things cannot compare with her. Ruslan says all of Matthew 25 teaches you to get rich. Ruslan says the five wise virgins is teaching you have enough money or provisions if Jesus don't return right away. The, the virgins who had extra physical oil didn't share with the foolish. So this doesn't help Ruslan's case to get a lot, to give a lot anyway. Here's Jesus belittling trusting in physical provisions. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. Je aware of their discussion, Jesus said, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 or how many basketfuls you gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I wasn't not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against, against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's ridiculous that Jesus would tell his followers, don't be focused on the physical stuff, focus on the heavenly stuff. Oh, but at the end of the world or your life, I'm going to focus on how much physical stuff you have. That is an absurd part of Ruslan's doctrine. Ruslan says the parable of the talents is about investing money. Ruslan says... Your money is not your own, it's God's, and he wants to check to see if you made it grow or not. 
Is there any chance Jesus is going to check people's 401ks and investment portfolios when he gets back and those who have not made more money, Jesus will take their money and give it to Bill Gates or some rich Christian? If Jesus said over and over again, life is more than the physical, don't worry about the physical stuff. You can't serve God in money. But somehow Ruslan thinks Jesus will check our physical money stuff. You're being willfully deceived. So far, every verse Ruslan uses to prove his point holds no weight. He conflates certain proverbs, which encourage us to be hardworking and not slothful, to having to necessarily be about making money. Jesus shown work for him doesn't mean working for a big fat paycheck, but spreading the gospel, discipling and doing good deeds, and you're not getting paid for it. Paul wrote these things about work to Timothy. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who has correctly handles the word of truth. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Preserve in them. Because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Anytime Ruslan says the only people who don't want to get rich are lazy, he should understand the Bible has a different focus to work than he does. Matthew 25 is Ruslan's big smoking gun proof text that the God who is spirit and tried to get his disciples to think and see beyond the physical really at the end of the day only cared about money and that serving Jesus faithfully and being a good steward means growing our bank account or investment fund. Well, see, Jesus said, don't start, do not stir up treasure on earth, only store treasure in heaven. So therefore, what does it matter? What does God care about my finances? Well, you ignore other obvious passages of scripture. And Matthew 25 is the most obvious one. Now, I've read this passage before over and over. People say, this isn't about money. God doesn't care about your money. It's not about money. He doesn't care about how you handle money. Well, the talents in Matthew Chapter 25 is actually money. It's not like talent, like I can play a flute, right? That's not the kind of talent. It's actually talking about money. Some say it's $4,000. Some say it's multiple years of a livable wage, okay? So the amount talked about here is not a small amount, okay? I've heard it all the way up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, $400,000 is probably the most, and I've also heard it uh, as little as $4,000. Nevertheless, this was literally talking about money, and this is one of the most controversial passages, depending on how you look at it, and people think it's exclusively spiritual, but they miss the parable that it goes, not the parable, but it, but they miss the story this parable goes into. So let's just look it over, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. This is Jesus after Matthew 24, after the wise and the foolish virgins not being repair, uh, return, prepared for the return of the bridegroom. And it go, he goes into this parable. So it's another parable. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Um, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, and he who also had two talents came forward and said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over, I will set you over more. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. It's interesting that in this illustration, this servant is calling the master a hard man. Why? Because he is gathering where he did not sow. Right, and he and he's 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 uh, reaping where he did not sow, and gathering where he scattered no seed. That's really interesting, right? So this last servant is saying, "Hey, I buried your talent. So I was afraid. Mm, that's the root. 
Here's the root. We're getting to the heart of the matter. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed? Question mark. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. Woo. But for the one who has not, even what he has, he has will be taken away and cast a worthless servant into the utter darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Scary passage. So people read that and go, no, Rusa, you don't understand. That's not about money. That's about fill in a blank. That's about us utilizing our talent here or utilizing the gifts that God has given us or utilizing all these other things. And I would say, yes, yeah, all about that and more. That passage is about your time, your talent, and treasure, okay? If you're born again in Christ, your life is not your own. You are now his. You belong to him. And everything he's entrusted you with, the time, talent, treasure, skills, everything is, is, is given to you by the master. And you are called to steward it, to manage it, not to bury it. However, in this specific verse, when we see Jesus acknowledging that a wise master and a wise servant, when it comes to money, would at least put the money in the bank and give it some interest so that it can generate some interest for the master. Now, this is the part where no one keeps reading. We stop at verse 30 and we go, oh yeah, that's a nice, cool story Jesus told about talent and treasure and all these different things, but it's really a metaphor, but they miss what comes right after that. Verse 31, when the son of man comes in his glory. So now this is no longer, this is no longer a parable. He's speaking literally to us. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So he's coming, he's separating the shepherd from the sheets, and he will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Hmm. Then the righteous will answer him, uh, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, uh, or thirsty and gave you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did to the least of these brothers of mine, you did on to me. You know what requires the ability to do all of those things? Resource. It requires somebody's money somewhere to have the ability to have extra food, extra clothes, extra time to take care of the least of these. And when you take care of the least of these, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, you're doing it onto the Lord. So we're compartmentalizing and we're saying, no, 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 no. That's not about money, even though the next verse is about people who have abundance of resource and money. Matthew 13, the four soils, the parable of the sower, I think fits with the parable of the talents. The third soil in that parable, the soil that is preoccupied with money, the deceitfulness of wealth chokes out the word, making it unfruitful. Why would Jesus tell us that if you worry about money and the deceitfulness of wealth, you will be unfruitful? Yet later on in Matthew 25, Jesus would change his position. And in that parable of the sower, it says if you're worried about money and you're chasing the deceitfulness of wealth, you're unfruitful. So you wouldn't be increasing your talents if you're unfruitful, like in Matthew 25. And is, is Jesus like looking nervously at God the Father and going like, oh, I hope he doesn't see that that one guy is not making more money. I hope he doesn't look. And then if he sees this other guy, he's making more money. He's looking at the father and being like, hey, look, he's one of mine. Aren't you proud? In the parable of the sower and in the parable of the talents, there's an allusion to multiplying what was given. 
I think both are pointing to someone who fishes more people into eternal life. Isn't that what Jesus told the first you know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, come follow me, stop fishing for fish, and I'll make you fishers of men. But he means for us to be like, well, no, yeah, they were fishing for people. They were trying to get more disciples, more people into the great wedding feast. But you guys, now in 2023, or whenever time you see this, I just want you guys making money. Jesus sent out his disciples to make more disciples, not more money. Jesus can multiply bread and fish. He doesn't need physical stuff or is limited by lack of resources. Jesus wants us to lead more people on the narrow road, and wealth is at best a distraction and at worst an idol. Ruslan, when you say you need money for ministry, you are worshiping money. You need the Holy Spirit for ministry. You need the Father for ministry. You need Jesus for ministry. You don't need money unless money is your idol that you worship. And even still, you don't need money. You need to repent and tear down your idol. Doesn't it make more sense with the parable of the talents that the thing Jesus wants to see us multiply is that we use our talents to get more people into the kingdom? So when Ruslan says that, hey, God wants you to be um, a good steward and faithful with your finances, I only think God cares as far as are you using it to spread the gospel. I don't think God is spending 0% of his time seeing like, oh, you made more money, so you're more wealthy, or so you're more trusting in your money for your future. I, that would so far go against everything so far the Bible has shown about speaking about wealth, about tell rich people don't trust in your wealth, about Jesus belittling people who thought they needed money. Even when he went to go pay his taxes, like Jesus with Peter, he goes, uh, go fish and a fish will you know, pull money out of the fish. Or when they were getting like, hey, it's going to take half a year's wages to feed all these thousand people. And Jesus goes like, come on, are you guys kidding? Don't you remember the time in the past when we fed 7,000 or 5,000 people and there was extra baskets? Like Jesus does not lack resources. I don't think he's looking at your resources being like, boy, you know, we're having a tight year. I hope um, Jim down there is, uh, you know, saving his money and putting it in his account. Why would he care how much money is in your bank account? I think the only thing that he would care about is your money is that you're not worshiping it. You're not relying on it. You're not putting your trust in it. That your hope isn't in building your bank account. All our hopes should either be when we go, when we die and we go to meet Jesus and hopefully he says, well done. Or our hope is Jesus coming back to earth. I mean, that's, that's, that's an example of marting the waters right away is he'll say some things that are true. They're like, oh yeah, God wants you to be a good steward of your money. Are you being faithful? But I think that only applies to are you being faithful and a good steward to spreading the gospel um, or taking care of the needy? I, I think Jesus could care less about whether or not you're getting more and more wealthy unless if you're going, you're going to give it away. But Ruslan so many times will go, oh, yeah, 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 that's all I meant. But then so many times he'll talk about, well, now I can use his money on vacations, what money can do for you uh, so you can enjoy things. Instead of hustling people from their money, Ruslan should be studying the Bible. And it's a joke he offers to teach you to study it when you can see how poorly he handles it. And do you doubt he uses people signing up for his free How to Study the Bible course so he can get them into his sales funnel so he can later get them into buy one of his other courses or join his Patreon so he can upsell them later on? Bruce Lawn. By the way, I got to make sure you guys don't miss this. We have a free how to study the Bible course in the link of the description and it's pinned up in the chat. This will get you more clarity, more consistency, and ultimately more life change for your application from the Bible. And so we're super excited about that because it's in bite-sized pieces and I think you guys will find a lot of value from it. And it, you also get these like super encouraging emails and get to know more about my life. Weird, because you feel weird selling somebody something. Sales shit make you intimidated. Sales is just closing the situation. Sales could be something as simple as flipping sneakers. You understand what sneakers are hot. Sales could be something as simple as flipping stuff on eBay. This is a lot of the Gary V stuff, right? Gary V inspired me. So I went through a season of just flipping shoes. Like as a grown man, like in my 30s. Why? Because I wanted to get better at sales. I wanted to get better sales. And then what? And then I understood 
products better. And then I understood how important it was to have Shopify and to know my margins and to know all these cord that syncs with my Patreon, but I don't really know how to work it. Shout out to all the Patreon. Y'all should consider becoming one of our Patreon. That was such a seamless tie-in. It's pinned up in uh, the description of this video. Today was the first days in the Supreme Court argument. And we're sharing this with you guys just because, one, we want you to know that, like, you know, this is this is happening now. It could be over for us. And and, and I, not, not us. All of us. It could be over for anyone making money off of the internet. Well, yeah, which includes people that are running ads yes. for their businesses. Yes. So it would cause a huge economic downturn as well. Because if you're not able to place your ads on videos, videos aren't being promoted, yep. like like the whole funnel, the whole funnel is completely yep. messed up. Yep, yep. I came in on, on was it yesterday? Yeah. And you're like, hey, man, this gets passed. We got to go work at a church. Hey, <laughs> we're going to have to go work at a church. I don't know what we're going to do. Zach reached uh, out to uh, uh, David Jeremiah yep. to make sure everything, he still had a job like, over there. my ducks in a row with my... Uh, <laughs> go work for a televangelist. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Hey, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see the full extended version of this podcast, be sure to sign up for our Patreon community for only 5 dollars a month. It'll really help us continue contextualizing the gospel using YouTube, media, and podcasting. And in exchange, you will get full unedited versions of the podcast, of our daily after-party streams, a discount for our merch store, and exclusive access to our private Discord server. It's only $5 a month. The link for Patreon is in the description of this video, as well as the pinned comment below. If you're feeling like, yeah, I don't think I want to sign up for $5 a month, that's okay. We also have links in the description of this video where you can make a one-time contribution on Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal. But but we really want to get you over on Patreon. So, Ruslan makes money by getting people to donate to him, by getting them into his sales funnel, by talking about God. But the Bible says this, then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he began to teach and to say to them, It is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den? Then the chief priests and the scribes heard this, and they began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. I read off multiple New Testament warnings of pursuing wealth from multiple New Testament authors and other supporting verses downplaying the need of money for the Holy Spirit to do its work. If the poor woman who gave two pennies and Jesus was more pleased with her giving, you can't tell God you went against his warning to pursue wealth because you thought Jesus was lying about the poor woman's two pennies being a better offering than all the rich people who gave that day. Ruslan, you talk about the things money could bring that you want. It's not just that you want to give all your money away one day. You say you want a Tesla. I could post in clips all the time where you say you wanted this house or that worldly thing. But if your conscience works, you will know that you've made such statements. Sure, Ruslan has some good works in the gospel. He defends the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but many things Ruslan says about money hurt the gospel. Paul warned about teachers or elders who seem to be greedy. I think when Ruslan talks about you sending him money to pay his bills, which his Patreon and merch do, it steals from the good he does in spreading the gospel. Why make it easy for the devil to whisper into the doubter's ear, look, here's another phony trying to use the Bible to grift easy money from suckers. It's not like Ruslan is independently wealthy, a plumber, who's telling you, hey, follow my example to get wealthy, doing something useful, and you can even take care of your older relatives' plumbing problems for free because you'd be a rich plumber and you'd have time and tools to do some free plumbing for poor people. No, with Ruslan, it, just to talk to him, you have to cost Patreon money or donations through the Super Chats. Ruslan makes money through his own admission, through his fans joining his Patreon and sending him money to pay his bills. And uh, got two kids and make money primarily. Originally, it was music, 2015. Quit, did music full-time for a couple years. Portion of my revenue still comes from that. Stuff like sync licensing, DistroKid, Spotify. Uh, past two years, transitioned more over to YouTube. Uh, revenue streams like Facebook, like Patreon, merchandising, that sort of How stuff. How long have you been all in on the, on the influencer YouTuber game? 2020 is when it, it tipped at the end of 2020. So gotcha. almost two years full-time with that surpassed all the and other And that is your streams. full-time career right yeah, now. Yeah, You're yeah. not rapping as much as you used to or nothing like that. I'm, I still make music, but okay. like I did a show earlier this month in Boston, but no, not as much because it, it just it makes sense to. Cool. 
and it seems to me Ruslan's skill is getting others to send him money with no value they get in return. Okay, money is a transfer of value. It's all it is. It's a, you, you add value to someone and they give you these little IOU slips called money. That's all it is. So it's Ruslan says money is only the exchange of value, but does he deny grifters have gotten rich many times in history offering no value or a deceptful value? Mark 7, Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of gods in order to observe your own traditions. Ruslan ignores all the red flags in the Bible about wealth and says you have a moral responsibility as a Christian to get rich. I would argue that it is the Christian's moral obligation to do so. That it, it, it is your moral obligation to do so. If you can build a seven-figure net worth without it mastering you, hear me loud and clear. If you can build a seven-figure net worth without it mastering you, without it ruining your life by investing $100 a month, okay, you should absolutely do that. Ruslan's teaching to get a lot of money, to give a lot later on, is in a vain human rule that sets aside the commands of God not to serve money and avoid wanting to be rich. Such a little thing. Follow me. Give the ring to Frodo. 